In April 2027, Chinese forces launched a devastating attack on Taiwan and American forces in Okinawa and Guam. American bases in Okinawa were rendered unusable and Guam was much reduced. On the ground, Taiwanese forces fought back valiantly but were unable to stop Chinese forces taking most of eastern and northern Taiwan. Chinese forces around Yilan are attempting to push south along Highway 7 and 9. Their goal is to cut off Taiwan's air and sea lines of communications through which the United States and other allies are rushing much needed supplies and reinforcements into the southwestern part of the island. Today, we're going to look at four different scenarios. In the first, the United States Navy tries to stay out of Chinese anti-ship ballistic missile range and there are no Chinese planes aloft. In the second, the US Navy stays at the same range, but the Chinese have fighters based at Taiwan International Airport. In the third scenario, the USN comes in close and launches a conventional fourth gen heavy airstrike to back up the Tomahawks. The fourth scenario demonstrates what could happen if the US has some of its more advanced weaponry available for action in numbers. So let's examine a very conventional Tomahawk strike first. Today, the 1st of June 2027, the USS Enterprise's carrier strike Group 7 is over 800 miles east of Taiwan, having used deceptive routing, bad weather, and anti-satellite missile strikes to avoid Chinese satellite reconnaissance. Its mission is to destroy the Chinese Integrated Air Defense System in northwestern Taiwan. An Integrated Air Defense System, IADS, is a network of radar command and control centers and anti-aircraft weaponry designed to detect, track, and neutralize incoming aerial threats. It aims to provide a layered defense through coordinated use of different types of sensors and weapons in space, the air, and on the ground and sea, rendering the Chinese forces pushing south from Yilan defenseless against follow-on strikes. At 0125 Desron 7, Destroyer Squadron 7, Escorting the USS Enterprise begin launching almost 200 Block 3 and 4 Tomahawk cruise missiles. The Tomahawk Block 4 Tactum is a standoff cruise missile with a range of over 850 nautical miles at a speed of 500 knots. It carries a 311 kilogram, 685 pound warhead and can strike hard and soft land targets as well as runways. Its range allows U.S. naval assets to conduct strike missions against Chinese land targets while minimizing the risk of Chinese counter-strikes. The targets comprise Taiwan International Airport, which was thoroughly wrecked in the initial fighting, but is now repaired, and three integrated air defense complexes, each comprising an HQ-9B battalion for long-range air defense, and multiple HQ-16 and HQ-17 batteries for medium and short-range air defense. Taiwan International Airport now houses multiple squadrons of PLA, Air Force, J-10, J-11 and J-16 fighters, drones, and even airborne early warning KJ-500s at 0248. The Tomahawk missiles scream over Ishigaki Island, passing the destroyed remnants of old Ishigaki Airport which began life as an Imperial Japanese military base in 1943, and Sinishigaki, the newer civilian airport. They're less than 120 nautical miles from their targets and still haven't been spotted. Because of the lack of airborne radars, the Chinese SAMs have to rely on their own ground-based radars, which are blocked from seeing such low-flying missiles by the Earth's curvature. Sorry, Flat Earthers. 0300 hours, the Chinese finally spot the incoming Tomahawks at just 20 miles. They have just two and a half minutes until the first missiles hit, which doesn't seem like much, but modern VLS, vertical launch systems, and TELS, transporter erector launcher, can put out a tremendous amount of fire rapidly. The HQ-16s open fire first with the Southern HQ-9 following suit. The outcome will be determined as much by magazine depth as it will by technology. With 160 HQ-17s, 96 HQ-16s, and 64 HQ-9s ready to fire, the Chinese have 320 missiles to weather the incoming storm of 192 Tomahawks. Mathematically, it is enough. But when you take into account the placement of many of the very short-range HQ-17 batteries, 
to guard from Taiwanese attacks from the south and east. This becomes less certain. The Chinese defense forces do well, but eventually the HQ-16s and HQ-9 batteries begin to run out of SAMs and the Tomahawks edge close. HQ-17s and close-in gun systems begin firing, but their extremely short-range leaves gaps the Tomahawks exploit to deadly effect. I ran the scenario ten times. On three occasions, the two HQ-9 battalions were destroyed. On the other seven occasions, the two HQ-9 battalions were damaged but remained capable of preventing additional strikes against the Chinese lines of communication running through Yilan. So far, so interesting, but in reality, Yilan would also probably be covered by airborne early warning aircraft and fighter cap combat air patrol. Airborne early warning planes can see much farther than most ground-based radars by virtue of the fact that they fly far above the Earth's surface. This should mean that the Tomahawks should be spotted earlier, allowing cap fighters to approach, identify them, and salvo their air-to-air -air missiles, thinning the Tomahawk attack out before it gets into SAM range. This should greatly improve the survivability of the SAMs at Yilan. Let's see what happens in practice. The Chinese KJ-500 airborne early warning aircraft spots the Tomahawks when they're still 80 miles from Yilan. It orders its accompanying flight of J-11BS, a two-seat Su-27 derivative, to go to military power and close on the approaching contacts to positively identify them. As the fighters close, they positively identify the Tomahawks using their radars and fire. A volley of 24 PL-15, long-range, active radar homing missiles. The Chinese commander orders all his fighters at Taiwan International to scramble and join the fray while the first wave of fighters close into PL-10, short-range infrared homing missile, and finally, gun range. As each flight launches from Taiwan International, it quickly turns east and volleys its PL-15s. Almost half the Tomahawks are downed before the SAMs open up at 12 miles range. The SAMs perform as well as in the previous variant, but this time, with only half the missiles incoming, the SAMs manage to take them all out before any impact. The SAM defenses around Yilan weathered the storm, and after reloading, a process which will take them about an hour, the Chinese logistics running through Yilan will be fully protected again. The American strike has failed. And after expending all of their Tomahawks, the Enterprise's escorts no longer have any long-range strike capability and must return to port to reload. And let's look at what the U.S. Navy could do if it was willing to risk getting closer. As they say, distance is capability. And generally speaking, the closer you are, the more damage you can do. In this variant, Enterprise's carrier strike Group 7 is only 300 miles east of Taiwan. It used deceptive routing, bad weather, and anti-satellite missile strikes to avoid Chinese satellite reconnaissance. Its mission is the same, but this time the Tomahawk missile strikes will be accompanied by F-35s and F-A-18 Super Hornet escorts and ground attackers. At 0103, U.S. Navy fighters start launching and forming up into their strike formation. A squadron of Super Hornetums lead, then F-35C, and finally EA-18 Growler, electronic warfare aircraft, MQ-25 unmanned tankers and bomb-carrying F-A-18s follow. Two E-2Ds accompany the package for airborne early warning and command and control. 0123. The Chinese AWACS picks up the non-stealth portion of the U.S. strike at almost 300 nautical miles. While they don't have positive ID on the contacts, it doesn't take them long to conclude that the 60 or 70 planes heading directly for them aren't part of a gender reveal flyover. The Chinese commander 
orders all planes at Taiwan International Airport to scramble. He has two reasons for this. Firstly, to get the fighters in the air in order to intercept and disrupt any incoming strike. Secondly, to minimize the damage inflicted by any American weaponry which hits the airport. 0125. The Americans realize they've been spotted, and the E-2D Hawkeyes and F-35s turn on their radars, and the Growlers turn on their jammers. Despite their radar being on the F-35s, remain relatively stealthy thanks to the ANAPG-81 radars, low probability of intercept design. This LPI design uses frequency hopping, spread spectrum technology, advanced signals processing, stealthy antenna design integrating antennae into the airframe stealth design, and lower power emissions in order to radiate whilst remaining difficult to localize. The American commander's reasoning is that by turning on the jammers, he will convince the Chinese commander that a carrier strike group raid is incoming and draw the Chinese fighters out where his AIM-260 can call the Chinese herd out of range of the integrated air defense at Yilan. It's now 0135. The Chinese radars at Yilan, the KJ-500 and nearby fighters are heavily jammed and can only spot the Growlers and the two Hawkeyes following on behind. This renders the initial flight of J-10s blind and sitting ducks for the longer-ranged AIM-260s carried by the U.S. escorts. Compare this to the U.S. radar picture which shows an extremely accurate picture of all China's airborne assets. This gives the U.S. commander a situational awareness advantage. But the question remains whether he can take advantage of it and wield this advantage to decisive effect. As the J-10s close, they begin to pick up F-18s on their infrared search and track IRST system. This is a sensor that detects and tracks objects based on their heat signatures. Unlike radar systems which emit radio waves and listen for their reflections to locate objects, IRST is a passive system, meaning it doesn't emit any signals of its own to give away one's own position. It also useful in situations where radars are jammed or you are facing stealthy opponents who may show up long before your own radar can detect them. They immediately volley their PL-15s. Unfortunately for them, the F-18s aimed 260s are already halfway to them. The J-10s evade as best as possible and go to afterburner, desperately trying to close the range in order to burn through the jamming and radio back more precise information on the incoming U.S. strike, information they will undoubtedly have to pay the ultimate price for. In the realm of radar and electronic countermeasures, or ECM, the term burn-through is crucial. It's the point where a radar signal becomes strong enough to override any jamming from ECM systems. Think of it as the radar finally seeing through the electronic fog created by the jammer. The key to understanding burn-through in radar versus jamming lies in how signal strength drops with distance. In radar, the signal weakens based on an inverse square law, while in jamming, the weakening is more rapid. Following an inverse fourth power law, here's why this matters. When both the radar and jamming signals are sent out, they both start losing power as they travel. But the jamming signal loses power much faster because of that fourth power law. So as you get closer, the radar signal doesn't weaken as quickly as the jamming signal. Eventually, the radar signal becomes strong enough compared to the jamming signal that it can be clearly detected despite the jamming. That point is what we call burn through. It's essentially the range at which the radar's eyes become sharper than the fog created by the jammer, allowing it to accurately see its target. Understanding these laws is not just academic. It's vital for real-world military tactics and explains why, once they know the power of their own systems on a given frequency and the power of the enemy system on that same frequency radar operators can figure out the distance at which they can achieve burn through against jamming and when their own jamming can be burnt through. If you're interested in a more detailed video on the topic of jamming and electronic countermeasures, please let me know in the comments and I'll oblige. The Chinese commander assesses that this is not a feint and orders the entire air component at Taiwan International, apart from a flight providing cap over the airport, to make their way east to disrupt the American strike. Growler jamming continues to mask the tomahawks. 
The stealth of the 35s and MQ-25s protects them, but the F-18E and F on either flank stick out. IRST on planes and low-light TV sensors and IR on HQ-9s begin spotting incoming F-18s at around 80 miles to Yilan. So far, the Chinese remain completely unaware of the tomahawk strike that's preceding the F-18s. As the two walls of fighters near, the Chinese begin launching PL-15s at the F-18s and the U.S. Navy launch AIM-120s and their last AIM-260s in reply. Fired at long range, the volleys of missiles are low on energy and speed by the time they near their targets. The escorting F-18s avoid all missiles fired at them, but the southern F-18 flight carrying GBU-32s isn't so lucky and loses three planes. In return, one J-10 and five J-16s fall in flames. The Chinese commander has lost a total of ten fighters for seven F-18s. He's quite happy with his performance so far, but frowns as the first tomahawks begin to be picked up by J-16 radars and more AIM-260s fired by unseen F-35s continue to rain down on his northern flank. The Chinese commander orders his second wave of fighters to call off their headlong rush towards the presumed location of the deadly F-35s and to concentrate their fire on the Tomahawks. He no longer believes his fighters can beat off the carrier airstrike, but bets that if he can thin the Tomahawks' ranks so that his HQ-9 survive, those HQ-9 will be able to hold off the carrier's airstrike. Distracted by the Tomahawks and the search for the F-35s raining down death in the north, the Chinese commander doesn't notice a single AIM-260 fired at extreme range making for the KJ-500 east of Yilan until it's almost too late. He orders the lumbering KJ-500 to dive for the ground at its pitiful top speed. But the Americans won't be denied and one of his precious KJ-500 bursts into flames over northern Taiwan as the AIM-260 peppers its right wing and engines with fragments of hot metal. Ironically, at precisely the same time, the American commander is also quite rattled. He has lost more F-18s than expected at this stage of the fight. His remaining F-35 and F-18s must self-escort themselves with AIM-120s, and he is beginning to think that won't be enough as more and more Chinese fighters rocket eastward from Taiwan International. His plan to have his tomahawks and small diameter bombs, SDBs, hit the Yainan Sams at the same time has also fallen apart as all of the anti-missile evasion has caused his attack component to fall 40 to 50 miles behind the tomahawks. He has no option but to let the tomahawks go in alone and follow it up with his ground attackers as soon as possible. If he can catch the Chinese reloading, this attack might still succeed. 0148 Massed Chinese volleys of PL-15 smash into the Tomahawks as the Chinese pilots try to attrit the Tomahawk strike. A squadron of 12 planes carrying six PL-15 missiles each can fire on 72 Tomahawks, enough to make a major difference to the odds of success of the strike. After expending all their PL-15s, the surviving Chinese fighters, two J-10, six J-16s, and 12 J-11 BS, are ordered to withdraw north of the SAM defenses at Yinan in order to allow the SAMs to engage freely without fear of friendly fire. Zero 0152. The Chinese fighters make a final pass with their PL-10 missiles before turning north to try for gun intercepts on the Tomahawks, making for Taiwan International. Zero one fifty three. 
With the air in front of them clear of their own fighters, Chinese Sams open up. The Tomahawks are at a range of only 10 miles, but the Chinese Tells and VLS launchers on the HQ-9s, 16s and 17s can launch a lot of Sams in that distance. The Tomahawks have been unsuccessful in destroying large numbers of SAMs, but they have attrited the long-range and medium-range SAMs significantly, with only 24 of 96 HQ-9B and 13 of 96 HQ-16 missiles remaining. The HQ-17 stocks look much better, with 113 of 160 missiles ready to fire, but they are extremely short-range and don't fully cover the HQ-9 and HQ-16 batteries. It had been hoped to supplement them with 64 additional SDB-2s carried by MQ-25s. But the J-16D have been successful in jamming their data links, and they have defaulted to return to carrier mode. They're out of the battle. The small diameter Bomb-2, SDB-2, also known as the GBU-53B Stormbreaker, is a precision-guided munition with a tri-mode seeker comprising millimeter wave radar, infrared, and semi-active laser guidance. It has a range of 60 miles allowing standoff attacks against medium and short-range SAMs and the ability to be retargeted during flight via Link 16. While the bomb's warhead is quite small at just 48 kilograms, 105 pounds, the bomb itself is only 173 centimeters, 69 inches long, and weighs just over 93 kilograms, 204 pounds. This means that even F-35s can carry eight of them, while the F-15E can carry up to 28, allowing them to overwhelm SAM defenses with sheer numbers. Most SDB-2s are targeted on the HQ-9B battalions, with the remainder targeting the various HQ-16 and 17 batteries. The Growlers fire their Argum ER at both HQ-9 battalions, believing them to be the largest remaining threat timing their salvos to arrive just before the Stormbreakers. The Super Hornets tasked with striking Taiwan International are ordered to hold back for now. The Tomahawk strike has achieved less than expected, and the American commander would rather guarantee the total destruction of the defenses around Yilan, leaving Taiwan International for another day, than simply damaging both locations, but not destroying either. The Argamiars scream in at 2,250 knots. They're successfully jammed by the J-16D until just a few miles out. But as they close, they pick up the HQ-9 battalion radars and home on them. HQ-16 and 17 batteries try to engage but are largely unsuccessful due to the low range at which the Argam ERs were picked up and their sheer speed. Three quarters of the missiles hit, destroy HQ-9 search and fire control radars and several of the self-propelled anti-aircraft vehicles providing close-in protection for each battalion. The Stormbreakers are spotted at only 10 miles. This is more than enough time for the Chinese SAMs to take them all out, if they were fully ammunitioned. That's a big if, though. The SAMs give a good account of themselves, but the sheer number of SDBs overwhelms them, and the SDBs slam home throughout Yilan province. Both HQ-9 battalions are severely damaged, while only a single HQ-16 launcher and seven HQ-17 TELs and a single self-propelled anti-aircraft gun survive. This is a heavy blow, but not enough to grant complete freedom from air defense for following strikes, so the American commander orders his two bomb-laden Super Hornet squadrons in. With clinical precision, the Super Hornets obliterate the remaining air defense at Yilan. Worried about the possibility of reinforcements from the Chinese mainland, or as I like to call it, West Taiwan, and aware that the HQ-9 battalion defending Taiwan International is undamaged, the Super Hornets are ordered to attack targets of opportunity. They obliterate ammunition dumps, petroleum, oil and ant lubrications, POL sites, suspected headquarter locations and troop concentrations before firewalling the throttles and going feet wet.
They'll be tanked on the way home before landing back on Enterprise as she races east at 35 knots in an effort to put as much space between herself and the inevitable Chinese counterattack. Meanwhile, the Chinese fighters pulled back to protect Taiwan International scour the mountains of northern Taiwan, looking for the missiles they know are on the way. As they spot them, they volley PL-10s and close for gun engagements. Desperate to defend the airport, the Chinese commander orders them to remain engaged as they enter the Chinese defensive SAM envelope. He's willing to trade some friendly fire losses for less damage to the airport. Luck is with him, and the SAM defenses hold up. All of the missiles are shot down short of the airport. So what was the outcome? The Chinese SAM defenses at Yilan were completely destroyed. In total, 16 HQ-9B TELs and their HT-233 fire control and YLC-2V High Guard 3D passive electronically scanned array search radars, 20 HQ-17 complexes, 16 HQ-16 TELs with their passive electronically scanned array fire control radars and 24 anti-aircraft artillery and self-propelled artillery complexes were destroyed. While Taiwan International survived, the PLA Air Force component suffered devastating losses with 81% of all aerial assets downed. Only a single BZK-5 Sea Eagle UAV, 2J-16D electronic warfare aircraft and 6J-11 flying sharks remain. Not enough to resist another American attack without significant reinforcement. The loss of two KJ-500 is particularly painful as limited numbers of airborne early warning aircraft are available. The Americans lost 10 F-18E and one F-18F. Essentially, one of the four crewed squadrons committed to the attack was wiped out. Dizran-7 has also shot all its tomahawks, removing much of the land attack punch of CVSG-7. In the grand scheme of this, the Americans achieved some of their objectives, but did so at a cost that would preclude immediate exploitation of what they achieved. By the time CVSG-7 is re-ammunitioned and its losses replaced, the Chinese will have been able to replace the SAM coverage over Yilan County. This attack was tactically successful, but a strategic failure at an unacceptable cost. The last variant showed a rather conventional U.S. attack. But what if the U.S. prepared and fought smarter? leveraging its technical advantages to the full. This is the question the FM variant answers. In this variant, the Enterprise carries two squadrons of F-35C and two of Super Hornets, as well as six EA-18 Growlers and 12 MQ-25s configured as tankers. That's a 50-50 mix of 5th and 4th Gen Strike aircraft versus the 25-75 mix in the previous scenario. But the really telling difference is a single B-1B Lancer equipped with 40 AGM-158 Jazz MER, joint air-to-surface standoff missile, extended range, fitted with omnidirectional electromagnetic pulse, EMP, warheads. This potentially revolutionary weapon arose out of the Counter-Electronics High Power Advanced Microwave Project, otherwise known as CHAMP. This was tested a decade ago and resulted in small numbers of deployed munitions and mounts being available in the late 2010s which appear to have been deployed in Libya and elsewhere. It has been superseded by the high-powered Joint Electromagnetic Non-Kinetic Strike Weapon, otherwise known as Hijinx, which features a smaller, more ruggedized warhead which can be deployed on a wider range of delivery platforms. Marrying the Hijinx warhead with the stealthy JASM promises the possibility of disabling Chinese SAM defenses on Taiwan non-kinetically in advance of a more kinetic follow-up. Or as the briefer says when the B-1 crew ask for details, this is an FM scenario, guys. The B-1B. Winnie the Pooh stages out of Guam and is loaded with a full load of 40 JASM missiles. 0119. The attack starts with both F-35 squadrons ranging ahead of the Super Hornets in two staggered waves as the B-1B launches 27 AGM-158s with microwave warheads. The attack is staggered so that the F-35s will precede the JASMs clearing the skies of enemy fighters, while the Super Hornets hit the Chinese SAMs as soon after the strike as possible. To 0121, the Growlers realize they have been detected and switch on their jammers. Hawkeyes also switch on their radars. 
The U.S. commander is following the 4th Gen Strike playbook as he doesn't want to give the Chinese commander any hint that this is a much higher tech attack. The Chinese respond by ordering a flight of J-10s on cap to head east on military power to close with and identify any incoming strike. The stealthy F-35s open fire on the J-10s at a range of 60 miles. 0127. These missiles are only spotted at 12 miles, leaving the J-10s with little chance. All four are destroyed before spotting a single U.S. plane or firing a single missile. The F-35s fire on the J-16s and the KJ-500 at 75 and 100 miles, respectively. Neither the J-16 nor KJ-500 see them. At 22 miles, the J-16 spot the incoming missiles. The KJ-500 has 50 miles to play with and desperately starts running east and dropping lower in an effort to either outrun the missile or lose it in the mountains. Amazingly, despite only making 400 knots, the missiles run out of energy, just a mile short of the KJ-500. If they make it home, they'll need a change of uniform for sure. 0136. The first flight of F-35s have expended their missiles and turned for home. The next flight moves up to replace them and keep hammering the foremost Chinese fighters. Incredibly, the KJ-500 manages to outrun yet another missile. Definitely need new uniforms and to enter the lottery the instant they land. Luck like this doesn't come around often. As more Jatams rain down, the Chinese finally begin to spot incoming F-35s using the OFC-3 system, integrating electro-optics, infrared and low-light sensors into a self-contained sensor system integrated into the IADS at Yilan. They also spot some of the retreating F-35s at over 70 kilometers, as those F-35s are facing away, exposing their far less radar and IR stealthy rear aspect to the OFC-3s. With that said, none of the SAM batteries are able to use this information to fire their missiles. So, the F-35s continue, closing the range on the fighters scrambling from Taiwan International. The Yijazm are only 30 miles out and still haven't been spotted. The Chinese at Yilan only spot the Jazms at less than two miles. And while they do their best and even get a missile off, there just isn't enough time before the EMP warheads begin going off, wrecking their radars, fire control, and communication systems. By the time the attack is over, only two of 80 tracking radars and none of the fire control radars at Yilan are operable. This is the moment the Super Hornets have been waiting for and a squadron immediately goes to military power and turns for Yilan from their holding position offshore. They'll be there in 10 minutes. The Chinese commander is torn as to what he can do. Leaving his fighters up high is clearly a death sentence, but he must defend Taiwan International. His compromise is to utterly abandon any effort to fight the U.S. Navy F-35s and Super Hornets and instead order all of his remaining fighters to treetop height within the mountains and valleys west of Taiwan International, his goals are twofold. Firstly, to survive future attacks, and secondly, to get eyes on any cruise missiles making their way west at treetop height. As his fighters die for the ground chased by a never-ending barrage, one of them spots a half-dozen cruise missiles making for Taiwan International, but, consumed by their efforts to evade incoming missiles, only one of the Chinese fighters manages to down a cruise missile with its PL-10s. The Chinese SAMs pick up the JASMs less than two miles from the nearest battery. And while their close-in gun systems do their best, they have no chance, and the EMP warheads render every fire control radar at Taiwan International inoperative. Interestingly, they also wreck one of the J-16Ds and two drones flying at low level as they are now so low that they are caught within range of the EMP blast. The way is now open for the second Super Hornet squadron to attack Taiwan International, and they go feet dry at full military power. Their primary mission is to render the airport unusable and, secondarily, to destroy as many SAM sites as possible.
Meanwhile, the Yilan Super Hornets begin dropping their GBU 32s, 1,000 pound JDAMs. With 120 GBU 32s spread between the dozen Super Hornets, they have the luxury of launching a devastating strike while holding roughly four dozen bombs in reserve. The GBU 32s devastate the SAM defenses at Yilan, leaving only four HQ 17 battery vehicles functional. Satisfied with their work, the Yilan Super Hornets turn northwestward seeking to add their remaining GBU-32s to the Typhoon of Devastation, heading for Taiwan International. While all of this was going on, the final F-35 flight downed the last Chinese planes over Taiwan, leaving only a single KJ-500 on the far side of the strait to act as impotent witness to what's about to happen to Taiwan International. Their job done and fuel and ammunition levels nearing bingo, the F-35s turn for home, while the Super Hornets equipped with 2,000-pound J-Dams take up a holding pattern east of Taiwan International, waiting for the 1,000-pound J-Dam-equipped F-18s to arrive and make the first run at the defending SAMs and hangars at Taiwan International. The U.S. commander wants to save their 2,000-pound bombs for the runways and taxiways. Chinese close-in anti-aircraft artillery systems fire over open sites, and the HQ-9 battalion even manages to get a single missile off. But nothing can stop the GBU-32s and the majority of hangars and tarmac spaces capable of holding Chinese planes are hit. The Elan Super Hornets wheel around and hit all the buildings and defenses left standing while the 2,000-pound bomb-equipped Super Hornets hit the runways and taxiways. In just a few devastating minutes, every single above-ground facility at Taiwan International has been reduced to rubble, and every runway and taxiway has been cratered by multiple direct J-Dam hits. Only a single HQ-17 anti-aircraft gun survived the massacre. With nothing left to bomb, the two squadrons of Super Hornets wheel for home, passing over Yilan and bombing targets of opportunity with any remaining J-Dams. In this scenario, the U.S. leveraged its technological advantage to win a complete victory without losing a single airplane. Yilan has only minimal local air defenses left. Taiwan International is a smoldering ruin, and its entire PLA Air Force component save one KJ-500 was destroyed. It is an overwhelming U.S. victory. Even more interestingly, the financial cost of the victory is less than the cost of the Pyrrhic failure in the third scenario. In the third scenario, the cost of replacing 11 Super Hornets at 67 million each and 192 Tomahawk missiles at 2 million each, plus the cost of expended ordnance, pushed the cost of the strike to roughly $1.4 billion. In the hijinks scenario, the cost of 120 Mark 83 and 48 Mark 84 bombs with JDAM kits is roughly 6.4 million all in. The 12 ARRGMER cost just over 6 million each and the 27 JASM roughly 2 million each. I estimate the cost of the AIM 260s at about 1.5 million per missile with 144 fired and the AIM 120s at 1.1 million per missile with 24 fired. All up that comes to a cost of just under 400 million for this strike. This is a theme we see again and again in modern warfare. Used properly, a technological and tactical advantage can yield outsized victories at, relatively speaking, moderate cost. By 0530, Carrier Strike Group 7 is over 400 miles east of Taiwan with its entire strike recovered. It is making 35 knots plus eastward while deck crews scramble to ready the returned strike with an air-to-air -air loadout in order to meet the expected Chinese counterattack. This is a wise precaution because, as we'll see in the next video in this series, as at this moment, multiple Chinese H-6 bomber regiments are winging eastward past Taiwan, seeking to visit hypersonic and, if possible, ballistic revenge on CVSG-7. I hope you enjoyed this exploration of what might happen if such a scenario were to occur in real life. If you'd like to feature as a pilot in the next video, please comment and leave your preferred call sign below. And don't forget to subscribe and turn notifications on to be notified when the next video drops.